I had too much coffee, so I do apologize in advance if I go too fast. I am trying to share my observations while using church. It's not going to be a regular research presentation. It's more going to be a definition of a problem and proposing a solution. So I want to define the church. What's church? Why do we use it for imaging? Very briefly. Okay, the difference of the church from a conventional sine wave is the phase signal is dependent on the time, which means if I plot the real part of this complex signal, what you observe is the frequency is changing by time. I think it's clear to you from this one. And this is a coding scheme. To decode the coding, you usually use pulse compression. A match filter is a good approximation usually, uh, which is a time reverse complex conjugate of the transmit signal. And when you convolve them, you get the pulse compression, which increases the resolution and signal to noise ratio simultaneously. So I will just go basically what's a pulse, what's a code. The difference is uh, you can have a long duration pulse, short duration pulse, or a coded excitation, which is longer and have more energy. Therefore, it's going to behave like a long duration signal, improve the energy, improve the SNR, but also going to have a better resolution. This is what you're going to see on an image. And when you apply envelope detection to Hilbert transform, basically, you're going to have a, a slightly better resolution for a long duration pulse. For a short duration pulse, slightly better resolution, a slightly better SNR. But compressed chirp is going to have the benefits of both. So it's what you're going to see on a beam mode imaging. It's a basic illustration. Bad resolution, good resolution, good resolution, and good SNR. So why chirps? I do, I do use chirps a lot. I did use them for tooth imaging before. The problem here is you have lots of attenuation. It's 8 to 10 dB per millimeter. It's a lot compared to soft tissue. Also, you need sub millimeter resolution because the feature of the tooth are really small. So for this case, chirps work amazingly because you have high attenuation and you need good resolution. Another case is the harmonic imaging. For this case, I use the high transducer to generate lots of harmonics in water. It's similar to a micro bubble case because you have high nonlinearity, high level of harmonic generation. So if you want to use this for imaging, you need to separate the generated harmonics. So this is a spectrogram of a, a single scatterer. If you get the signal from one of these wires and plot the spectrogram, which means time and frequency distribution, you will see this pattern, which means you will have a, a fundamental signal, a second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic is going up all the way, and they are overlapping in time and also in frequency. So if you manage to filter them, you will have the second harmonic image, which has better resolution than the fundamental. And if you use the higher order harmonics, you will get a better resolution than the second harmonic bars. The noise levels are going to be not as good as the previous one. So I try to apply chirps to microbubbles as well. And it's the worst case scenario so far I've encountered with chirps. Why? Because you have depth and frequency dependent attenuation. I mean, you have this for all modalities, all ultrasound imaging modalities, but microbubbles increase the attenuation. Also, the nonlinearity caused by the microbubbles increase the harmonic levels as well. Another problem is the broadband noise, because you start destroying bubbles when you're doing imaging, you then create white noise, broadband noise. And the last one is the worst for the coded excitation, because you have this resonance behavior of microbubbles, it's going to change the phase of your signal. When I say phase difference, I mean this. This black line here is the scattered pressure from microbubbles. But for this example, 4 megahertz is the peak, the resonance frequency of the bubble. So when, the, when you hit the resonance frequency, you will get more scattering, but also you will have this effect on the phase. The phase is going to flip, which means for the coding algorithm that you completely caught up in your code around this region, which is the most important region for microbubble imaging. So, so how does the pulse compression work? You know, why it works? How do you use it? So first, I wanted to look at the single microbubble. So I did uh, make some measurements with a high-speed camera, then measured the radius of these microbubbles, and then calculated the scattered percentage from each microbubble. Uh, let's have a look at the resonance microbubble. What happens to a resonance microbubble? So the gray line at the background is the transmitted signal. And I plotted the received, received signal scattered percentage from a microbubble on top of this one. What you need to pay attention here is the phase of the signal is the same with the transmitted signal as at the beginning. Not exactly the same, but similar. So the scattered, scattered pressure follows the phase of the transmitted signal. But after a while, when you hit this resonance behavior, the phase flips. It doesn't follow the phase of the transmitted signal anymore. So it's a really one of the worst case scenarios for pulse compression, actually, or any other coded uh, 
exaggeration method. But if you look at the larger macro, for example, the case is not as bad as the previous one. The phase usually follows on the low frequency part of the transmitted signal, and on the higher part, you don't get anything at all. So you lose bandwidth, but the code still somehow works. For a smaller size micro bubble, uh, what happens is you don't get too much scattering into between the thumb as well, but mostly you get scattering around this high frequency region of the third. And if you want to do fast compression on these signals, for example, this is the resonance case, you can still do fast compression. I mean, the gray dashed line is the autocorrelation function. You get similar behavior on the main lobe, but the side lobes are a lot higher than what you would expect. So this, this is the 40 dB line, which you need for most of the imaging applications. So if you want to do imaging with this, you're going to have a really bad quality in this phase. But I did use them for subharmonic imaging, for example. And it was possible to do that was really good. OK, I will roughly explain. Uh, this was a flow phantom. And this is a tissue mimicking material, and there's a channel in between where you can flow your micro bubbles. And if you look at fundamental image, uh, it's fast compression, so chirp excitation and fast compression. When you look at this one, micro bubbles are flowing in. You will be able to see them, and you will not be able to differentiate them with the, from the background, from the tissue. However, if you apply proper filtering, for this case, I extracted the subharmonic behavior, and you can color this channel with this red to yellow. Basically, you can detect microbes, you can filter them out and get a composite image where you can identify microbes from tissue. I mean, to explain the problem better, this is one of the basic setups every person who worked on uh, microbes characterization did this many times, hundreds of times. So you put a transmitter and a receiver, ideally with a 90 degree or like something except 180 because you want to measure the back scattering from microbubble. And if you plot the spectrogram of the scatter signal, I like this. Uh, spectrogram means frequency and time, the energy distribution over a frequency and time plane. What we are looking at is like black, black means lots of energy, white means no energy, basically. This is the fundamental case where this, the frequency is transmitting, and this is the second uh, harmonic region. I put these red lines here. These all have different bandwidths which means this chirp is different chirp rate. So this one is a lower chirp rate, this one is slightly higher, and this one is slightly higher. So these are hypothetical lines. I just put them on top to show you the chirp rate, the behavior of the transmitted signal. And if you look at the scattered signal from microbubbles, you see the trend. It follows the chirp rate of the transmitter. And it's also the same for the second harmonic. I mean, not the same. The chirp rate is doubled because it's not harmonic, but it still follows the same rule. And if you put, if you increase the energy, you start getting more second harmonic, and also the fundamental energy is increasing as well. When you go to 300 kilopascal, for example, for this case, uh, you start getting ultra harmonics and sub harmonics as well. Uh, things are getting a bit more complicated. And if you increase furthermore, now you starting to destroy the micro bubble, which means these, these lobes are not as identifiable as before. So they are starting to get mixed up. And if I increase more. So there is no clear division between any of those. But we know from the previous experience that this still has the same chirp rate and the second harmonic as well. You can visually compare and see they have the they have different chirp rates. So my conclusions are, I already said this one, scattered pressure from microbial population have the same chirp rate. But a chirp rate means the second derivative of the phase. It's still phase related somehow, but it's different. Uh, harmonic, gener harmonic generator microbubbles obey the same rule as well. For the end time, for the end time, you get n times the chirp rate, and it's also applicable to subharmonics and superharmonics. Pass compression works somehow, but it's not the ideal case to use with microbubbles. One of the conclusions I get because it decreases the dynamic range and image quality. You get high side bubbles, uh, but you still get contrast improvement. So it's not bad or good, but it's not the ideal case. For me, the ideal case is using transformation or signal processing techniques that are based on chirp rate instead of phase. What does this mean? There is a transformation family called linear canonical transform. This includes Fourier transform, fractional Fourier transform, or Fancher transform, which helps you to modify the frequency time plane. So you can turn the spectrogram to one side, get the information you want, turn it back, use the information, filter the signal out. 
So for me, it's the best case scenario. And the references are in the proceedings paper. I didn't want to put the equations here to make a boring uh, presentation. Uh, I want to take, thank my colleagues from University of Leeds and also ETSRC and Liverpool for supporting this research. Thank you very much.